Since the first serve day seven years ago, the people of Milestone have gone above and beyond to show God's love, meet needs, and bring the hope of Jesus to thousands of people. This year, some red shirts got a head start on key projects. So in many ways, it's become more like Serve Week. We're out here at a widow's house. There's a few tasks that needed to be done, and I know Diane, her, her husband who passed away, um, this was on his to-do list. And so we're out here as a church to get this done for her. Instead of playing soccer today, he decided to serve. It means a lot for me to have him out here because I'm a first generation Christian, so I want him to have a running start so by the time he's my age, hopefully he has his son out here, so it's a generational thing. Our school receives Title I funding. We have over 520 students here, which means we have a high percentage of students that receive free or reduced lunch. What we know is if kids come to school and their basic needs aren't met, then we can teach all day long, but they're not going to learn anything if their tummies are hungry. Whatever the situation is, everybody goes through times that are difficult in their life. So for them to be able to trust that we can partner with Milestone to be able to provide this opportunity for them to come and get these groceries, I don't know that you could even put that into words. Our teachers are really great about providing snacks for kids and helping them if they need just basic needs. If you surveyed our teachers, you would find out that most of our teachers spend quite a lot of their own money to be able to do things just as simple as having snacks in their classroom for kids. It's unreal. I literally, I mean, I could have never, I mean, the email said to dream big and to think, you know, as big as you can, but to get all this is just amazing. I want to see the faces of my kids too. They're going to be so happy to see you. They're going to ask me, what happened? Yeah. Miss Garrido, did you go shopping? I said thank you to you guys. Thank you guys so much. This is amazing. My kids are going to enjoy all of this. What Milestone is doing tonight for our teachers, I mean, for our teachers today, listening to them talk about how they can't believe that somebody would do this for them and help them. What Milestone gives back to the community is just phenomenal. I feel like a little relief. My son gonna have something for eat the whole week. Not just today, the whole yes. week, probably the whole month. Yes. And I feel happy because they are my war. They, yeah. they are everything for me. I don't have family here. I, I don't have anybody and feel like I'm going to have people caring about me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you. Probably look like this is not a lot, but this is everything for me. Trust me, it's everything for me. The local church in action is unstoppable. And making an impact like this is impossible without people like you giving your time, skills, and resources, combined with your amazing heart to love and care for others. Thank you, Milestone family, for being the hands and feet of Jesus to thousands of people this Serve Day. a series if you're new it's our third week and we're talking about family let's talk family and the reason that we do this series is first of all we all care about it and we need help with it it's something most of us just sort of walk into but we don't always have the equipment to know how to invest in something that's very deeply important to us and so we, we need help in fact I have to preach on it and, and I need help, you know. I try to be transparent. I share some things, and, and I'm always in a marriage series trying to make sure I don't end up in marriage counseling. Y'all know what I'm saying? The next thing is it's a top prayer request that we receive. One of the number one, maybe health and family being the top two, so we receive prayer requests. And, and, and the reality is there's not a lot of places in culture today where you can get God's perspective on it. So the Bible provides answers, and it also provides for us some practical help. And so in this series, I want to give you some help in the area that you care about the most. This week, I want to talk about what family, and as a family is formed, the Bible makes it very clear. You never get out of the first pages of the Bible where God goes, I designed this. A man shall leave his father and mother 
And then he will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And then Jesus affirms that same statement, and then Paul affirms Jesus. And so a family is formed when a man and a woman come together in a union that's not institutional. It's not an arrangement. You don't get to decide the arrangement. It's a, it's a covenant before Almighty God. And then they come together, but the truth is the way they come together in the context of that environment is a word that we talk about a lot, and we have a holiday for it, and we all want it. It's, it's love. We, we want to have love in this place because we are designed for love and I want to be loved and I want to give love and receive love and the family's supposed to be a place where we experience love. But I want to spend a few moments talking about how the cultural view and even maybe your perspective or your experience with the word love may, may be different than what God says love is. Because if love is the fuel for the family, we got to know what it is. See, we even use the word, you know, I love fishing, I love the outdoors, I love my wife, I, I, I love bluebell ice cream. Can I have an amen? I, I, I love all these things. I say I love, I, I love my kids. And so how do you sort out that we're using the fact that we love all of these things and yet the Bible in Proverbs actually tells us what a person desires the deepest longing inside of us is to experience unfailing love. We want to be loved. We desire to be loved. But the fact is, as it becomes this family unit, it's something we want so much, but many times we don't know how to access this love that we desperately desire. I think about family photos. The reason we like photos and we're big into pictures in our culture because it, it brings emotion when we look at that photo and those people. Now for me, I have to take family photos, you know, as a family and put out the Christmas card so it can be a little dangerous, you know. Um, in fact, we have like an inside family joke. We don't say cheese, we say chinchilla. And you're like, why do y'all say that? Well, because I'm six foot three and they always send me short photographers. And I've had this challenge because during the photo, they want to shoot me right up in the jowls. <laughs> Anybody understand dimensions? If you don't understand dimensions, you need to learn it because they'll use you in the family photo. You know, you take the 13, 14, 15-year-old boy, you stick him out front. Like, and there he is, big. Then you're in the back. You look skinny. But they just shoot you right there. And so I'm always telling the photographer, no chinchilla shots, okay? Because if they shoot you up in the throat, you'd be looking like a chinchilla. Some of y'all didn't even know a chinchilla was a real thing. <laughs> no chinchilla. But the fact is, we enter into this relationship and we have this picture of what it's going to be. It's like, I love you and you love me and we're in love. In the early parts of it. But I want to say this. If you have God, I'm going to show you how to access what God has for you. If you stay humble and you get some tools, your picture doesn't have to look like where most pictures end up, end up torn and tattered. And it's not this. That's why this area can be so painful. Because if we don't get some tools, if we don't get God on our side... Like the expectation of love can be missed. And you can have a shattered picture. And the reason a lot of people have a different image that they're shooting for. In fact, I want to say to you and say to young people today, what if you had a picture of love for a lifetime? Love for a lifetime. The fact is our culture, though, is confused about love. I hear this phrase a lot. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. We, we fell out of love. You don't make me happy anymore. Here's the one that we see all over the news headlines. We're just not compatible. It shouldn't be this hard. We have irreconcilable differences. We have very few models around us today where two people love each other for a lifetime. We paint that picture. And by the way, 
Many people misquote divorce rates. A lot of people are like, well, you know, half of marriages end in divorce. The fact of the matter is since 19, in the 1980s, actually, the divorce rate has fallen. It's down around 40-something percent or so, but here's the problem. Young people aren't getting married. They're just not getting married. So I'm, I'm scared of what could happen if I unite myself to you and I give myself to you, so let's just live together or let's just date around and let's just swipe right and let's just kind of fulfill our own pleasures. And what's happened in our world, I'm talking to you about God's desires and the cultural backdrop that your children live in, is a world that says happiness is found in career and success and money, not in marriage. But God says different. God says something totally different. But to do that, we got to know what love is. Because if we want love and we desire love, then we need to know what love is. I love the fact that the Bible tells us what love is over and over. In fact, the Bible says that God demonstrates his own love for us. Whoa, there's a change. Wait a minute. This is not an esoteric, just superficial feeling. Well, I fell out of love with you or I might love you and I don't know if I'm feeling the fire. God says, I demonstrate my love for you. John 13, 35 says this, by this everyone will know that you're my disciples. If you can stand up and tell the culture what's wrong with it. No, 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 no. that's not what it says. The way you love one another. The way you love one another will be the exemplifying mark of if I'm involved in your life, the love of God. So when I said, we want to know what love is, some of you from the 80s were thinking about a song. I want to know what love is. <laughs> Come on, 80s people. That's a big time 80s hairdo right there. That song comes from Foreigner, actually written by the lead guitarist and going through a difficult time. And he wrote these words, I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. I want to feel what love is. I know you can show me. In fact, the interesting thing about this song, by the way, it's the first pop hit went to number one that had a gospel choir singing in it. Gospel choir, while recording, things were off. They went and prayed, came back, and it was magic, and it ascended to number one. What's happening there is it's tapping in to a need and a desire in every human being. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me what love is. Some of us, again, are saying, okay, how do I put my hands around that? What would that look like? And I want to spend my next few moments helping you understand what love is so that you would base your relationships, by the way, in your marriage relationship, but also know how to love your children, also know how to love your friends. Three Greek words describe love in the Bible. There's one, eros, it's an ancient term, not defined per se as the word in the Bible, but the concept is in the Bible, and that's romantic or passionate love. That's why we send little, little hearts, th things with chocolate in them, because we're trying to show passion and love to one another. It's one of the most dominant themes in our culture. The feeling-based romantic love, by the way, the Bible talks about passion and romance and sex in the Bible, it's present there, and that's part of God's desire and plan with two human beings that have committed their lives to one another. But there's other words for love. Phileo is used 25 times in the New Testament. This is talking about friendship and family and love that's more characterized by your devotion to one another. I'm devoted to you. But many times in the Bible, when the Bible uses the word agape, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John is a love book. <laughs> and in 1 John, used multiple times, 31 times, he uses the word agape or agapo. And that word for love being the predominant theme that God wants us to get, get this, Unconditional love. Unconditional, not based on conditions or circumstances. First John 3.16, I love this. Foreigner asks, it, I want to know what love is. John says, this is how we know what love is. 
We don't have to ask somebody to tell us what love is. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to see if I feel it today. I'm going to see how my feelings are and then I'll decide what I'm going to do. He said, no, by the way, while we were his enemies. When we, this is one of the most important things in relationships, period. Go first. Don't worry. He said, she said, they said, they didn't. Jesus went first in that while we were yet sinners, he came and said, I'm going to love you unconditionally. He also says this, dear friends, let us love one another. Okay, wait a minute. Where does this come from? Does this come from some romantic, esoteric, exact moment, perfect light, perfect weather, perfect situation, perfect person? No, he says love comes from God. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is, listen to this, this isn't a feeling. It says God is love. That's who he is. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You're like, okay, I got it. Now, how do I get some tools? How how do we adjust our thinking? How do we, because I don't think there's anyone listening to me, even if you put up a rough exterior, who doesn't want to be loved, who doesn't want more love in their marriage, more love with their kids, It's like, how do I access this? What does that look like? By the way, this is very important to know. This was sort of revelation to me. People don't feel what you feel unless you act on it. So you have to to act. You're like, but I I do love. I do love. But, But wait a minute. Jesus demonstrated. It's along the way. For me, by the way. I had more vision for my marriage and my family than I did our church. In fact, the greatest compliment that I've received this last week is not how many people served at Serve Day, though I'm very proud of our church for being a church that just loves the community. Not how many people came to Easter. Not how many people I've spoken to. But my son was at a ministry event, ran into a colleague of mine, It got back to me that they said, your dad came and preached at our staff meeting, and it was so great. He said, my dad's actually a much better dad than he is a pastor. Highest compliment I could ever receive. I decided early on, I didn't want to just be famous. I want to be famous at my house. I wanted to love in an intentional way. And some of you young families right now, you're like, oh, that seems so far-reaching. By the way, it doesn't matter what your career is. It doesn't matter what your hobbies are. Make sure you're winning at what you'll actually care about. And so young families, I started setting up things. In fact, I'm thinking about teaching on some of these anchor moments that we do along the way to show love. Think about one. I think about my daughter and my son-in-law here dedicating my grandson My daughter, when she was younger, I had a moment with her to talk about who she would date and who she would marry. And I know there's some of you young families praying for your kids' spouses. You should. God will answer those prayers. But you need to be involved. The world we live in just says, hey, just go out there and explore it on your own and hope you'll find out what love is. And I started talking to her about, I want want to be on the team and I'm going to be a part of this and help you. And I gave her a little heart-shaped locket that had a key to it, but I held the key. By the way, dads, if you have daughters especially, you're really key to them knowing what love is because your words of love to them are more powerful than anything that they can ever receive. But she found this brother with good hair, and he's amazing. (laughs) And she got engaged, and we came to this moment at the rehearsal dinner, and at that rehearsal dinner, I took that key in a special moment, and I gave my son-in-law the key to her heart. You say, why are you telling us this? I'm just trying to offer encouragement to families and and people. Look, we got to show them what love is. Not just say, I love you, 
show them what love is. You're like, okay, how do we do this? How do we think about it? Well, number one, here's what you have to know. You're like, well, I didn't come from that background. I don't think I have those tools. I didn't see those models. Let, let me say, didn't you love that on the testimony video? I'm a first generation Christian and I have my son serving with me. You can change your generational future. You can be a part of that, but you have to know this. Love doesn't float around circumstantially. Love comes from God. It's supernatural. This is a supernatural union. And because God is love, he's constant and never changes. So if God's at the center of our relationship, then we don't fall in and out of it because he doesn't fall in and out of love with us. If we have him as the center, I, I, and let me tell you, I'm meeting so many families, I'm praying with them, and we're getting prayer. Life is so busy today. You meet anybody, it's like, we're just busy. We're just busy, right? And so busyness even, just all the stuff going on. How, how do we stay in love? How do, we, how do we have a love for a lifetime? Well, what a lot of people do is we just pursue life independently and it's like, well, I'm into this, and this is my hobby, and this is my career. And, and, and what happens is we're just, we're just hoping the lines get close so we stay in love. This is why there's a world filled with people who are after love but seem to never obtain it. So over the years, it's like, well, I just hope, I hope, well, that was a good date. That was a good, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me offer a better solution. Young people, listen to me. You're not looking for someone that you just, yes, you fall in love with, but let me just tell you this, you're looking for someone that loves God more than you. Because them just saying, I love you. By the way, girls, a guy will say anything. I love you. I'm really in love with you. No, 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 no. I don't need you just to be in love with me. Because if you're in love with God and I stay pursuing God, what happens is no matter what comes in our lives, we don't continue to move this way. God brings us back together and we intersect around his character and his nature over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps pulling us back. There's no perfect marriage. The people in the Bible weren't perfect. I'm not perfect. But I tell you this, as I seek God, I'm a better husband to my wife. If I'm closer to God, then I'm better at loving her because it's his love. You got to know this. This is not an institutional arrangement made by human beings. It's a supernatural bond that comes from almighty God. And when he's at the altar center of lordship over our families, he keeps pulling us back together. The enemy's trying to separate us. Number two, love is unconditional. It's not a contractual agreement. This is why we get off with this love thing and we're trying to know what love is. The Bible word is covenant. So our world is filled with contracts. That's why there's so many attorneys. Our whole country's run by attorney. Everything is, I've got to make sure I know the fine print. So if you and I enter into agreement, I've got to know the fine print. I've got to know how to prevent and mitigate risk when I come into that relationship so that you don't hurt me, so that you don't use me, so that I can make sure that I have recourse against your actions. Everyone at every campus, listen to me. The Bible does not explain marriage as a contractual union between two, between two agreed parties. A covenant is a covenant that is a supernatural union ordained by God that makes two individuals one flesh. And that is characterized by the promise that I make to love this person is not just a promise to them if they meet all the standards. It's a promise to Almighty God. Everything else in our culture is transactional. The marriage relationship is not a transaction. It's a covenant union. And when I make it between me and God, then God brings me together with this other human being that bonds us together. You say, I'd like to have more love in my relationship. Well, look at the person that you're married to and say, I'm with you forever. You're mine. You're my girl. You're all, it's me and you. Me and you and God himself creates a threefold cord that cannot easily be broken. Here's the third thing, and I'm going to get real practical. Love is shown. If there's one thing that we need to know that is the reason that we don't feel like we can apprehend love or I want more love in my marriage, I want more intimacy in my marriage, what we see here is, is love is not a fleeting feeling. Love is a choice and an action. 
Love is a sacrifice. There was recently done a survey of 600 couples who were in critical marital counseling. They go in and the survey out of these 600 couples show, interesting, you would think, man, they hate each other. No, actually, all of them came to counseling and indicated, I deeply care about this person. I deeply care about them. That's why this area of our life is so painful, because these are people we deeply care about and we deeply love. So what that's indicating is, I do care, I just need some humility and some tools to know how for them to show, for them to see how much I care. So I'm going to give you some practical ways to, to show love. Not to just feel love, but to show love. Sometimes the action precedes the feeling. Most of the time it does. Practical ways to show love. Number one, love gives. Love gives. Love gives, and this was revelation to me, by the way, too. If I want someone to feel how much I love them, then I have to show them and give to them love the way they receive it. Heard a story a few years ago, a a lady that, that, that I highly respect. This is a godly person. This is a godly woman. I mean, there was this moment where she got a revelation from her now daughter in laws. She had sons, and then she has these daughter in laws. And there was a moment where the daughter in laws sat her down and said, Hey, when we come over to your house, like, I, I appreciate how much you do, but, but like you, you know, going over to the food and then you make sure there's no smudges on the microwave and, and you serving and, and, and all the stuff you're running around doing. How many of you know she's trying to show love? By the way, they were telling her, we don't want you to do that. We just want you to be with us. But they were saying, hey, we want you. Do you see the principle I'm trying to say? This is very practical. You can be like, I'm trying to show you how much I love you. But you got to start understanding the person. This works with kids too. My biggest revelation about kids, they're all different. They're different than me. I didn't realize. I thought they would all just be like, they'd like my things I like. I mean, you're like, what planet did you come from? I mean, did a stork drop you off here? Are you even, What? You have to learn how to show them. Can I say to some of your parents, join, quit trying to make them into who you want them to be, but join them in the way God's made them. Show that love. Give that love in a way they can receive it. Here's the next one. Love deals with offense. Love deals with offenses. Short list. Light bags. If you're going to love for a lifetime, we live in a world today where you get extra credit for being touchy and offended. We've created platforms now for us to all give our offenses and our opinions, and I don't like that, and you didn't do this, and they should have done that, and why don't we do that? So we have a whole world that is critiquing everybody. But the fact of the matter is the Bible doesn't give extra credit to offense. Great peace have let they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. And quick to forgive, slow to anger, quick to forgive. One of the greatest ways you could show love is to Overlook, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. It bears things. It endures things. It it overlooks offenses. The more love, you're like, I don't know if I can do that. More God. More God. More Jesus. Because Jesus knows how to do that. You're like, I just don't think I can. You can't, but he can. You can't, but he can. Next thing is love speaks. You could change the intimacy with your spouse by the way you talk. Communication is one of the top things that marriage counselors and pastors talk to people about. And by the way, it's not just what you say, it's how you say it. It's tone. It's, it's, it's understanding that words have power. Your words have power. The Bible says that life and death are in the power of the tongue. James is constantly talking to us about what the tongue can do. I I, I tell you, I grew up in a, maybe it was a generational thing, but but I grew up in an environment where you didn't get a lot of affirmation for doing what you're supposed to do. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My mom was more encouraging. She said, you're too hard on him. My dad, though, man, you don't, I go say, way to go when you did what you were responsible for. Are y'all with me? 
I think it has some bad things about it, maybe, but I tell you one thing, it, ra- it brought a group of people that were self-motivated, because we're not looking for the uh, approval of others, and so there's some self-motivation. Today, it's like, you're amazing. You're still at my house, but I wish you would just be more amazing. But the fact of the matter is, because I grew up in that atmosphere, to be really honest, I had to learn how to love in my home with my words. In fact, I probably was even better at it with my kids. I had three daughters, have three daughters. So I had to learn affirming words. By the way, dads of daughters, don't let some hairy leg dude tell her more affirming words than you. Man, come up to my house looking for my girls. Brother better bring game. <laughs> but those words matter. My, my, my dress, you look beautiful. I just, you know, look, I house full of girls. They're late. I think it was a country song, waiting on a woman. Y'all know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's been hours. Hey, this just doesn't look good. You look amazing. You're beautiful. And those words have power. They sink into our souls. I saved this last point. In fact, I moved my points around. It's serve week, serve day. But man, I think it is the single greatest thing you could do if you're saying, I want more love and intimacy in my relationships. Love serves. Love anticipates and meets needs. I want everybody, every campus, everyone listen to me. If you get nothing out of what I've said this weekend, you're like, I want to know what love is. Find a way to serve and add value to the people that you care about in your life. Find a way this week to say, hey, how can I serve you? Anticipate it. Do it on your own initiative. Find a way to serve because serve, that's what Jesus did in our lives. He stepped down from his place, and he came down to our place. That's why serve day is so powerful. It's like I was at that outreach at the schools there, and just just seeing these people, they're just overwhelmed that God sees me. Why? Because somebody served them. Somebody cared about them. Somebody who didn't need anything from them with no strings attached, with no angle, just showed up and said, I just want to serve you. I just want to take a towel and a little bit of water and wash your feet. Every time we do that, you're not just saying, I want to feel love. You're demonstrating it. You're showing it. I want to pray for two groups of people this weekend. First of all, I got a prayer request recently that says we've been married for three months and we're dealing with each other's baggage that we brought in. The reality is that's what happened.